So that sort of, those are two measures of how close you are to fusion, because you have to get the temperature up very high, and you have to get either very high density or long confinement time, or some combination of the two. These black dots are where we want to be. This is at the level that PB11 ignites, and this is at the level where it would actually burn most efficiently. This is where we are, approximately, and this is where IEC is, which is way far. These are many orders of magnitude. This is a factor of 100,000 between these two lines. So they're way down. They're pretty good in temperature, but they're way down in what we call N tau. And FRC is way down in both. And just for comparison, although the Tokamak guys hate when I do this <laughs> and get mad at me, this is where the Tokamak guys are. Um, and they're trying to burn DT, which is a much easier uh, fuel. So they're not even in this race. But they're behind anyway. Um, Sorry, can I ask you? Yeah. The fuel is what, solid or, or gas? The, the fuel, there are a number of, of uh, compounds of hydrogen and boron, which we could choose. We've chosen decaborane, which is, uh, has the formula H10, uh, B10, I'll get it, H14B10, um, for two reasons. That's a solid? That's a solid at room temperature. But if we heat it to approximately 100 degrees or 120 degrees centigrade, it develops enough vapor pressure to fill the chamber to the pressures we want. And we're looking at that for our first experiments with hydrogen boron for two reasons. One is it has the biggest ratio of boron to hydrogen. It comes closest to a one-to-one -one ratio. So there's the least waste in heating up fuel that you won't be able to burn because there's not a pair around. And second of all, even though the fact that it's a solid makes it inconvenient in the sense that we're heating it up, these compounds all are somewhat toxic. And they're not usually, usually toxic but they are toxic. And having it in solid form means that wherever it is, it can't escape without going against a pressure um, differential. Because once it's in vapor form, it's in, the vapor, it's in the chamber, which is at much lower pressure than atmospheric. Uh, if we used, for example, pentaborane, which is a gas at room temperature, then we would have to be much more careful and aware of the possibility of leaks because it would be stored at presumably at high pressure. So for those two reasons, we're using decaborane. Now for the initial experiments, and we're still in that phase, we're using deuterium because deuterium is a very well-known experimental gas for fusion researchers, and we're still optimizing the performance of the machine. Do you believe you'll move on to pentaborane or diborane if you manage to get this to work? No, because if decaborane works, as I say, it has the advantage that you're not wasting a lot of energy heating up hydrogen that can't possibly burn because there aren't enough borons around. Decaborane would be the best if we can get it to work. So. We've made a number of advances that we think will get us to fusion much quicker than our colleagues in the uh, DPF community, which is I developed a quantitative theory starting over 20 years ago. The quantitative theory implies that we have to shrink everything down to get good performance. So our electrodes are about half the size of our colleagues in Las Vegas, quarter the size of our colleagues in Warsaw, which is actually the most powerful machine in the world. And that enormously increases our performance over theirs. Secondly, we've developed, through a suggestion of one of my colleagues, Aaron Blake, 
the idea of an axial field coil to give a certain amount of angular, controllable angular momentum that will control the size of the plasmoid and increase the efficiency of energy transfer into the plasmoid. And finally, there's a quantum effect, a quantum magnetic field effect, which has been discovered a long time ago, which we're applying to reduce the electron temperature because it make, makes it inefficient for the ions to heat the electrons, and it's the electrons that radiate the X-rays. Now, as a result of some of these innovations, our preliminary experiments over the past year have actually shown we are getting better results than the historic trend in DPF research. This is the current, the peak current that people are feeding into the machine versus the neutron yield. And people ask, if we're trying to get a neutronic fusion, why are we excited about neutrons? It's because we're using deuterium. Deuterium, half the reactions produce neutrons. It's very easy to measure, it's very safe, so it's convenient. So this is a measure of fusion yield. And what you can see is we're actually about a factor of 10 above this trend line. And at the moment, we're trying to get some points before the end of the year, somewhere up here, if the machine is willing to cooperate with us. What would that sound like? Is that the 45,000? No. At the moment, we're trying to operate in the range of 30 to 35,000 <coughs> volts. Um, basically, the problem is that the switches we bought for the we bought we didn't design them. We should have, but we bought switches commercially, which were supposed to be designed for 45 kilovolts, but were actually designed for 25 kilovolts. And as a result, we've had to spend many months redesigning the switches and learning switch technology. I'm a physicist. That's one of the reasons we hired Fred, because he is a, he's a real electrical engineer. I just have to pretend to be one. Um, we had to learn a lot of switch technology, which we didn't expect to have to learn, in order to redesign the switches. We're hoping this week to demonstrate firing the entire bank at uh, around 35 kilovolts. To go to 45 kilovolts, we're going to have to do some reconstruction, which will take us probably two or three months. So I think it's going to be the spring before we're operating at full voltage. But we can get up into this area of one megaamp um, with a lot less than. To get up to uh, with 45 kilovolts, we hope to be operating above two megaamps. So this is a picture of our machine in neighboring Middlesex. Um, you can get some idea of the scale of this, this whole device is, this is just six feet off the floor. We didn't count on hiring Derek at the time we made that. <laughs> Doesn't matter. We find, well, there's so much equipment now attached on the underside that if you don't duck your head, you're in trouble. We were thinking at some points of getting helmets, but we decided not to. Mm -hmm. So these are the, the capacitors that store the energy. These are the switches that have been giving us trouble. These, these have to be fired within about 10 nanoseconds of each other. And then this is the little electrodes which are here are exposed because they don't have the vacuum chamber around them. And that's a very nice close-up Rosman took of the 14-centimeter electrodes, which is one of our varieties. So the size there is important, you said. And so what do the other people bring to the table? How much, how much bigger are they? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, a, I, I'm confusing people a little. The key thing is that these are very small diameter. This is five centimeters from here to the outside. Fourteen centimeters refers to the length. We have six sets that are different lengths that we'll be using for different experiments. 
In our experiment, it's five centimeters. <coughs> the biggest, most powerful machine in the United States is located in Las Vegas. By coincidence, it's just twice as big, 10 centimeters. That means they're running with four times less density and they get, roughly speaking, and this is rough, about 16 times less neutrons, less fusion. The people in Poland, in uh, <coughs> Warsaw, who actually happened to have the biggest, the most powerful capacitor bank, by coincidence, they're just exactly four times. So they've got 20 centimeter wide. They're running at much lower pressure, and their performance is much lower than ours. Um, and recently, we've discovered I, I discovered I overlooked another big machine which is operating in Iran. And their the coincidences don't extend. They're about two and a half times bigger than the Warsaw machine. So again, their performance is way, way down, almost a factor of a hundred below what we're getting for similar energy input. Uh, do you believe you can miniaturize it further than its current The size? problem with miniaturizing it further is mechanical strength. Basically, the um, two things put stress on this piece <clears throat> of copper. One is the pinch forces themselves. Pinch forces are trying to crush that piece of copper, which does have a hole in the middle. And second of all, there's even though copper is highly conductive, at high frequency, energy travels only in a thin uh, sheath called the skin depth. So that thin sheath starts to warm up a little bit, and that expansion causes, a, this again, pressure to crush this. So we calculated this 2.8 centimeters as the minimum that we could safely go to. Now, we may find in practice, maybe we've over-designed it, but that's basically what limits making this smaller and smaller. Couldn't you use a composite, perhaps, for strength, and then use the copper as just the skin of that? Yeah, it's possible. Uh, the other thing, well, first of all, we're not going to use copper in the final device because copper will absorb too many of these x-rays. We're going to use beryllium. Um, however, when you talk about the strength of a material, especially a metal, you're really not talking about its intrinsic strength. Its intrinsic strength, like of a single crystal, is generally orders of magnitude higher than uh, a manufactured piece. It's really a question of how do you manufacture it, how do you cold roll it, and so on. So it's certainly possible that future advances, or even present-day advances we don't know about, will increase physical strength and could allow us to miniaturize this further. I don't think that we're going to have what I dreamed about as a kid, you know, your pocket fusion generator, but uh, it's pretty compact already. Well, the arc reactor from Iron Man. The what? Yeah. 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 Iron Man filmed the little reactor. Oh, yeah. uh, I missed that film. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll um, get it, get it, watch it on Blu-ray. <laughs> <laughs>